Good morning. My name is Robin Patel from the Mayo Clinic, and I'm pleased to introduce PL3. Professor Jonathan Iridell is an infectious diseases physician and clinical microbiologist specializing in critical infections and transmission of antibiotic resistance. He has led an NHMRC Center for Research Excellence in Critical Infectious Diseases at the Westmead Millennium Institute for Medical Research since 2011. He's a fellow of the Australian Society for Microbiology and was president of that society from 2014 to 2016. He has full professorial membership of the Australia and New Zealand Intensive Care Society, is a foundation fellow for the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia Faculty of Science, and is going to talk to us today about strategies to develop novel phage therapy from regulatory approval to personalized therapy. Thanks, Robin. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is a topic, this is sort of old and sort of new, and it's nice to review, and for some of it, it's nice to think about for the first time. I guess it's nice to preface this uh, by reminding us where we are overall with managing infectious diseases. Obviously, vaccines, we think are fantastic. They're really served us well in some diseases. They're less suited to others, very highly specific not toxic, despite what you sometimes read on Twitter or Truth Social. Um, antibiotics, of course, have the advantage of just about covering all of the bacteria that we've got. Recently, of course, we're increasingly concerned about the evolution of, you know, the adaptation to resist the antibiotics as bacteria on the planet become more and more exposed to them in the soils and the oceans and the humans that populate the planet. Um, and I guess if you look at the natural predators, which we're going to discuss in a minute, which is the viruses that infect bacteria, the bacteriophages or phages, um, they're highly specific, rarely toxic, and uh, they also cover most bacteria. And in fact, when Edward Jenner was first inoculating to manage smallpox, we had um, Ernest Hankin realizing that there was something in the Ganges that was, and the Yumna rivers that was protecting people from cholera. It wasn't until about the First World War when Frederick Twart, who was a British bacteriologist, um, like Hankin, um, realized that you could filter something through a porcelain membrane, didn't quite understand what was going on. And only a year later, a French Canadian microbiologist called Durrell Felix Durrell actually named this, coined this term of the bacteria eater, the bacteriophage. And it was the 20s and 30s that were the heyday of bacteriophage therapy in Western and in Eastern Europe. And it wasn't really until the 40s and the post-war industrial boom that it was sort of swept aside by the development of the antibiotic revolution. So still when you read about bacteriophages, it's always pitched as this kind of weird story, this strange history. Um, and to some extent it was marginalised, I guess, by the post-war industrial boom and it was, uh, was supported by Stalin in uh, the old Eastern Bloc. And in fact, the famous, uh, the famous Selyava Institute at, in Tbilisi really arose from those times. <clears throat> Excuse me, but there has been active phage therapy units available since the early 1920s, most famously this one in Poland. And of course, the Eljava Institute continues to provide uh, therapeutic phages since the late 30s. And of course, this has moved on now. We mustn't forget that the history in Western Europe is old and, and much venerated. And the Institute Pasteur has certainly been a very important figure in phage therapy for many, many decades. More recently, we have champions emerging from the Queen Astrid Hospital. This is Jean-Paul Pirnay at the Queen Astrid Military Hospital in Belgium, who's been providing therapeutic bacteriophages in intravenous form, so GMP grade, 
if not GMP certified, for many, many years now. And increasingly more recently, we're seeing funding directed to individual institutions. We've got the Taylor Lab at Baylor College, UCSD has now developed IPATH, um, and we've got um, the University of Pittsburgh, that's Graham Hutful in the bottom corner, providing Mac mycobacteriophages to most of the world, it seems, at the moment. So most of us have an experience of phage therapy really as rescue therapy, as anecdote. And I think this is an illustration from our own experience. This is a young lady who went home to India to visit her grandparents, got knocked down by a car, got a dreadful resistant uh, NDM pseudomonas in her leg involving the metal work, spent a year in and out of hospital, you can imagine, on drugs like Calistin, with increasing failure, missing a lot of school, getting a lot of pain, spending a lot of time in hospital, really uncontrolled progressive osteomyelitis. And it got to the point where amputation was being seriously considered, and our colleague at the Children's Hospital Amani Katami reached out to what was then a nascent organisation that was developed to try and integrate all those sort of heroes in the science labs that I mentioned previously who were making phages available to doctors around the world who wanted to use them largely out of desperation. And this is uh, Ran Nair Paz and uh, Ronan Hazan from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem who had a, a terrific little um, anti-pseudomonal phage which their colleagues in New York purified for us and uh, we had a terrific outcome. So this is the kind of anecdote that we're used to and still phage therapy is seen as this kind of anecdotal story, a bit of fringe medicine, but in fact its history even here in Australia goes back. Uh, something like 15 years when um, Tony Smithyman in Sydney and his then PhD student San Morales, Sandra Morales were importing phages from Georgia to cell labs in Sydney and uh, a company called Amplify uh, was developed then. Um, they, we originally worked with them to treat someone with a UTI in 2007 but this then went on, um, Amplify developed, they become what is now Amata based in San Diego, and they've developed some staphylococcal therapies which are now at the trial stage. So I want to go and talk soon about the sort of clinical trials that are out there at the moment. But one of the questions we all have to ask ourselves is, is what's important? What are we interested in? So we did a survey of Australian, um, Australian infectious diseases physicians and asked them what they thought about the issues that confronted them when we mentioned bacteriophage therapy. In the top panel, you can see a word diagram which basically summarises the response was, well, it's simply not available in any sort of a timely fashion. And when we use it, we don't know how to do it. So what we want is availability, we want structure, we want safety, and we want some efficacy data. So they're really looking for a clinical trial type structure. This is what the Australian physicians were asking for. And when we ask them what sort of targets they're after, they're the ones that we think of as the rescue targets. That is those things that routinely fail antimicrobial therapy, you know, the, the infections that get into bones and joints and hardware, the, um, the infections that are resistant to antibiotics. So no surprises about what people wanted to see. And when Chip Schooley and Stephanie Strathdee sort of summarised where they thought we were a couple of years ago in our progression, they projected that we would be hopefully at the stage of rigorous clinical trials. Actually, I think that was a little bit optimistic. I think we're still at the individual case experiences at the moment, but we are starting to see some RCTs emerge. If you look at the RCTs that are listed on clinicaltrials.gov at the moment as currently recruiting, we have uh, a few that, uh, I've mentioned IPATH a minute ago, this is Chip Schoolies uh, and the team at, uh, at UCSD. So they're currently looking at, um, at a pseudomonas study, anti-pseudomonal phage study in cystic fibrosis. Like a lot of people, there's a few obvious low-hanging fruit. The early adopters, the cystic fibrosis community with problematic pseudomonas infection that can't be shifted is an area where people are often looking. And so we've got trials coming from them. We've got trials coming from Armata. That's the team I mentioned before. We've actually used their combination in Australia and that in 
a case that I mentioned a minute ago, and we've got the team at Yale and Felix Biotech. So the interesting thing is we're getting a mixture of trials looking at intravenous delivery, looking at nebulised delivery. Those three at the top targeting pseudomonas, Staph aureus, bacteremia is the other obvious issue here because we've got a lot of prosthetic infections, refractory infections, implantable devices, that sort of thing. So again, our mater are looking at a, an antistaphylococcal uh, cocktail, if you like, a combination of um, predatory viruses against bacteria for treating um, Staph aureus bacteremia. And that study is actually running in the US where it started to recruit, and it's starting to recruit in Australia very shortly as well. And then we've got the APT group looking at oste uh, diabetic osteomyelitis. Now, I think that's an IV prep. Interestingly, Intralytics, which has got uh, a bit of a track record in producing phages for food preparations um, environments, is doing an oral therapy targeting uh, E. coli in, in, in inactive Crohn's patients. And Locus Biosciences are doing an interesting study where they're trying to understand what sort of dosing schedule to use by using a, a multiple ascending, single ascending dose kind of strategy to get the pharmacokinetics right before launching on a 500 strong RCT with a two to one randomization. So I think what it reflects here is that people are taking a punt on dosing strategies for some, so that many of them have got fixed dosing strategies, but others are saying, look, we actually don't know what the right dose is and we're going to try and figure it out. And the delivery route is typically intravenous or nebulised, and you can see, as I said, the low-hanging fruit are obvious. Here in Australia, we, we could see that people were going to continue to request it as rescue therapy. You know, so things like Mycobacterium abscessus that simply won't respond in a CF case or a lung transplant or a, a staph infection that you just can't manage or a pseudomonas infection that's horribly resistant or indeed anything else that's horribly resistant. So we rationalised that the sensible thing to do here was to do some sort of a process study. So what we did was we gathered together as a group of physicians around the country and agreed on a protocol for data monitoring which is not particularly rocket science. I mean, to us, it just felt like common sense. But the process trial, rather than an RCT of a product, is the fundamental difference in this study. So we're saying, if you've got a product, a bacterial, a bacteriophage product, that is um, suitable for therapy and is safe to use and is signed up by your local health, you know, a human research ethics committee and signed up by your drug community as safe and sensible, then the real question for us is, have you got a uh, structured approach to, to administer this and can we gather data about your experience in a systematic way? Because that's what's seriously lacking. I mentioned to you that um, Jean-Paul Pirenay at, um, in Brussels has been providing phages for years. He lamented to me not long ago that of all the phages he's provided, he estimated only about 15% does he get any feedback from the clinicians about the upshot of the cases that they uh, provided GMP grade phages to treat. So we didn't want to reproduce that. If we're going to use this as rescue therapy, as um, what in the US you'd call an IND, what in other jurisdictions you'd call compassionate access, then we need to be studying what we're doing as we do it and to be as safe as possible as we go. But there are some key challenges we face when we use these viruses. So clearly when we're talking about the most diverse and ubiquitous life form on Earth, the viruses that prey on bacteria and prey on bacteria exclusively, there are very important biological considerations if we're going to use them as a therapeutic. One obvious thing is if there is a phage for every bacteria, and I think we believe there is, and a bacteria for every phage on Earth, then when you're treating a human or indeed when you're treating an ecosystem, then you have at least a three-way dynamic. You have the virus interacting with the bacteria and responding to that interaction, because this is a dynamic population of viruses that are reproducing. You have a bacteria that is responding to the injury of the viral attack and trying to co-evolve to defeat it. And this is a, an evolutionary process that is 
probably half a billion years old, so it's a very mature evolutionary process. And then, of course, you have the host system, which in our case is a mammalian host with a quite sophisticated, innate and adaptive immune system. So you've got a very complex dynamic. It's not just shoving a drug in and measuring clearance. And over those 300 plus million years of evolution, as I said, this predator-prey relationship has become very mature. This is very unlike antimicrobial resistance. Because although we lament the fact that bacteria are rapidly adapting to exposure to antibiotics, when you stand back from this, most bacteria have not adapted at all. I mean, in our own hospital, for example, 90% of the bacteria that we meet in the bloodstream of people who come in crook would respond to the usual hospital antibiotics. We have yet to reach the point where every bacteria on Earth is resistant to every antibiotic Earth on Earth because that is the natural consequence of a complete evolutionary process. So at the moment, bacteria are still crudely adapting. They are changing their genomes, they're acquiring genes, they're losing genes, they're mutating in response to bacterial pressure. It's really rather a crude evolutionary process which is no way near mature. And of course, with a sophisticated co-evolutionary process, you have enormous population plasticity, because these are only small genomes, remember. These are the, only about the size of a biggish plasmid. You're typically talking anything between 30 and 200 kilobases of DNA. Usually, typically, the ones we'd use therapeutically would be double-stranded DNA viruses. So these things have got enormous population plasticity, and when you're administering a dose of virus, you are administering an evolutionary potential inside that population, and that's something we need to remember, totally different to administering a vial of penicillin. And so what this means is that when you choose a therapeutic fudge, you have to acknowledge that some are gonna be better than others. Their host ranges differ. I mean, they've all got their little targeting specificities, and they're very specific, just like an antibody can be specific. They interact with each other, sometimes in complement, sometimes uh, in antagonism. Some of them are capable of moving into a resting episomal state when the bacterial population is stressed, for example, by nutritional stress. Others are not. Um, you can, in fact, in the laboratory, as we heard yesterday from Jeremy Barr when he gave his talk in the afternoon symposium, you can train a phage so that you get, if you like, the phage from the future, so that you can have a phage that has sort of adapted to the little moves that the bacteria will make to try and resist it. And clearly some phages will be better than others. They're going to have more stable capsids. They're going to last longer in the fridge than others. And this has quite significant implications for the way we construct clinical trials, the way we make therapeutic claims, and of course the way we set up our diagnostics and perhaps even the way we regulate. At the moment, what we do for testing feels a bit like and deceptively like testing for antimicrobials. I mean, we, we can grow up our lawn of bacteria, we can drop you know, a droplet of a standardised inoculum of viruses on top and look for a zone of clearing. And it feels intuitively a bit like dropping a bit of uh, kefazolin onto a, a bit of a Wattman disc and watching it diffuse through the media. But the limitation of that circle has got nothing to do with diffusion constants. It's all about that evolutionary battle where the virus and the bacteria battle to a standstill at the edge of that zone. So it's a very different kind of concept, but it looks much the same. And so practically, it's relatively easy to introduce into the laboratory system. But the biological, the inherent biological variations mean that standardization is a bit of a is a bit of a tricky one there I think we do of course growth dynamics and many times the results you get from the so-called plaque assay where you punch a hole in a lawn by dropping viruses on top and the growth curves actually can be a little bit contradictory but obviously if you can suppress the growth of a healthy E. coli or a Staph aureus in you know, Mueller Hinton broth or something by adding phages to it, you feel confident that it's going to suppress the growth in the human. And there's no doubt that you can add phages to antibiotics and get extra bang for the buck, true synergy. Now this varies with the drug. What's not clear at the moment is how class 
specific this is. For example, can we say that, well, every time you use a quinolone and, a, you know, a standard myovirus that is obligate lytic, you'll get good synergy, or do you have to test it each time? I think that's not clear at the moment. A lot of us could make guesses, but I think they would be educated guesses until we have more data. But we do know that when you have synergy in vitro, it can extend into the animal model. And again, there's been some nice data published in eBiomed and Jeremy. Jeremy Barr referred to some of that yesterday afternoon. So apart from the biological variations to give you a headache, the other issue to remember is that, you know, it's not a drug. We talked about training. We talked about the phage from the future, the idea that you can try and anticipate the easy trade-offs that the bacteria will be able to make. For example, stopping it to express a receptor or changing the, the way the surface receptor is made available or adapting some sort of resistance mechanism that's internal after phage adsorption has occurred. And you can, you can train up your phages populations. Remember I said this is a very plastic population. You can train these populations up to the point that you can have a potent and much more prolonged suppression from that population against the same thing. The other problem with using these viable agents as opposed to just a drug is this concept of auto-dosing. So what you can see on the top right, that little match signal, is just a, an analogy I like to use so that some people will say, look, if you want to treat bacteria with a phage, all you do is chuck as much phages as you can of that bacteria and stand back. A bit like throwing a match at a fire to just get it burning. Because we know that the phages, once they hit those bacterial populations, of course, start to amplify. And in the bottom left corner, you can see the classic Lotko-Alterra equation, the, the predator-prey dynamic that we're so used to if you model foxes and rabbits or something like this, so you can consider bacteria and, and their predating viruses. Obviously, if the virus preys on the bacterial population to the extent that it diminishes it, it runs out of food, and the viral population thus subsides. The food population then increases, the viral population follows. And so you have this predator-prey dynamic. And this is why some people say, well, look, just give one big dose up front, stand back, job done. It'll keep going, it'll burn out until the population's extinguished. I think there are actually some biological reasons why that is a little bit of an oversimplistic concept, and I actually don't trust that myself, but as I say, the, some of that data are not yet clear. The graph that you can see, and I'm sorry this is such a complex slide, but the graph that you can see shows this to some extent. Now, this is that lass that I showed you before, the little girl with the sore leg who had a treatment with a single phage. She was well. She was um, asymptomatic um, except for these episodes of recurring pain and in that hospital with fever. When she started treatment, she was afebrile and this was basically an elective, set of ther an elective therapy. But what we saw immediately after the infusion of the antibacterial virus was a flush of pseudomonal DNA into the bloodstream, which was easily detected by uh, a simple quantitative PCR. This was accompanied by a rise in C-reactive protein and a rise in inflammatory gene uh, transcription and a fever and some localised pain. And soon thereafter, a rise in the amount of bacterial viruses, the phage that were present in the blood without changing the dosing strategy. So we got a classic amplification response. This is the auto-dosing phenomenon. And we think in this case, what almost certainly happened was that there was a, an attack on that population of pseudomonas in the bone in this young girl, and that that amplified the bacterial phage population. And this is the concept that people talk about, throwing, throwing a match into the fireplace and setting a fire going. And we think this is normal, don't we? If we treat syphilis, secondary syphilis, with with penicillin, we expect a bit of an inflammatory reaction. If we treat pericardial tuberculosis with um, 
with anti-tuberculous drugs, we expect to have to use prednisone to control the inflammatory response. So I think it's a bit unsurprising, but it does point out what I'm talking about. And that immune response that we saw, I presented some more details about that yesterday, but essentially it can be summarised in two ways. Firstly, you have the classic innate immune response that you would expect, not only to the infusion of a virus, but also to the, inf to the sudden release of the bacterial debris into the bloodstream. Here we detected the DNA, but presumably we released LPS and all the other sort of muck because her transcriptome showed a rise in all those, um, you know, classic TLR4 type pathway genes, so implying that she had an antibacterial uh, inflammatory response. That then subsided and then you could see at the predictable time point, about seven to ten days, you start to get the adaptive immune response genes lighting up and that's when we started to see things like IgG and IgM starting to emerge against the, the virus that was being regularly infused. We don't know if we're getting circulating immune complexes in people who are who are getting a lot of this therapy. It doesn't appear to be a problem at the moment, but it's something in the back of everyone's minds. So if you're interested in this topic, this has long, long been talked about and is well reviewed, but it's clearly an issue and neutralizing antibodies may be a limiting factor in some, but not all phage therapies. So the next question is how you actually make this work as a, as a you know, a self-sustaining industry because the problem at the moment is this is seen as rescue therapy. It's all very well for us to be able to take a best guessed rational approach with an experimental therapy to rescue a desperate situation. But if that is all that we ever do with bacteriophage therapy, we will never really understand how to use it properly. We'll never really understand the best use cases because I don't think they've been established. And we will um, never be able to go to our local formulary in our hospital and simply prescribe phage 22B, please, to go with the kefazolin for my chap in bed six who's got staph endocarditis. Because if this is going to be useful adjunctive therapy, it needs to become professional. It needs to be managed by industry. But there are some big business issues. And when we asked business, we surveyed business about this question on behalf of the, the national group, Farge Australia, it was clear that people were concerned about intellectual property. Remember, this is something that high school kids can dredge out of the uh, backyard. You can dredge it out of your own saliva. You can find these things everywhere. They are completely ubiquitous. And so it's very hard to establish an intellectual property position around a naturally sourced and ubiquitous therapeutic agent. And this means, of course, that the regulatory frameworks are just really not established at the moment. No, one, no one's clear that this is a medicine, a drug, a biological. What is it? What do we call it? How do we use it? What do you do if you're trying to get something on the market? Uh, my, I mean, I'm not a business person, I don't really understand this, so um, you'll excuse me if I clumsily go through this, but this was just downloaded from Google. My understanding is that um, you have to sort of traverse this, what we have often referred to as the valley of death, and you can see that, you can see that little curve going below the baseline there. This is what we always talk about when you, when you come up with a great idea, you think it's going to save the world, but how do you make it a professional therapy delivered by industry, available in your hospital when you prescribe it? And you have to get through this pathway where we are now, which is we're relying on, you know, grants from government bodies, philanthropic stuff, a little bit of industry support by the optimists, the early adopters. We need to get through to the point that it becomes self-sustaining. We need to get back above that baseline because that's the only way to get through to this. So how do you do this? Our approach, because I think this is a natural approach for all researchers who are terrified of losing grant funding, is to huddle together. And so we all huddled together around the country. Originally, we started in Sydney and Melbourne and here in Perth as a group of people who were already sort of doing this and uh, already providing or starting to provide therapy. Um, and a few supportive colleagues from overseas, 
um, mostly academic groups really, to try and set up a national farge of researchers and clinician scientists. So if you like a, a sort of a like-minded group, a coalition of the willing, if you'll forgive that analogy. Um, and our ambition is to establish the trials we need to do, to establish the best use cases, to understand when this is really going to be cost effective and when it's just really going to be a waste of money and not worth doing. So we have to know whether we're going to be able to transition this from, you know, anecdote into normal bedside practice and what that bedside practice is going to look like. We need to first make sure that we've got quality phage available and we need to establish some sort of prescribing protocols and diagnostics and monitoring. And these last two, this last section, this establishment of best practice, was where we devised this process type protocol that we call the, the STAMP protocol. And so we've got together a group that now involves, this is the leadership team, so the whole team is really quite large. Um, but essentially, it's, it's most of the big teaching hospitals around the country are now engaged in this. A lot of the big universities around the country are engaged in this. We've got hospitals in the cities, hospitals in the country. We've got more two dozen sites now registered in this trial. And our challenge is to provide material. Because our intention is to try and shape the future of this. We, this is an opportunity we don't want to lose. I mentioned the market. We think that if you write, if you develop the right kind of clinical trials, and we're not going to talk about clinical trials, we just don't have time, but to some extent, I think you in the audience can see the way people are looking. Um, things like you just heard Stephen talk about the SNAP trial, for example. You know, an arm in an adaptive platform trial is a logical way to introduce this kind of stuff as adaptive therapy. And we believe that if you build in a proper health economic and implementation research strategy into those kind of trials, you not only drive an internal economy that supports a production system, but that you start getting real data. So that's a clear thing that we need to do. The intellectual property is a bit of a challenge. Clearly, because they're, modif they're just little viruses, they're only 200 KB, they are a bit, they're not that simple to engineer because it's actually, it's actually a bit of a tight fit to fit all that DNA into that little capsid, believe it or not. And there are some issues, some technical issues around engineering, but suffice to say that it is perfectly feasible to genetically modify phages, and that is something that is being done. Clearly, that generates a new genetically modified organism, so that is covered by standard patents law. That means that investors from industry will look at that and say, yes, I can secure that, yes, I can support that. Clearly, you can chemically modify phages, you can use little linkers to put things on the outside. I mean, for example, we're using uh, pH uh, reactive linkers to link um, antibiotics so that you can deliver antibiotics or, if you like, imaging um, chemicals um, to the outside of phages so that they deliver these things to site for synergy and for the purposes of imaging. And clearly, you can develop new formulations, so combinations of drugs and phages that you have proven are synergistic or phages and phages that you know are synergistic and have good, good uh, useful host ranges, you can improve the way they're packaged to make sure they last longer. So there's lots of areas where you can have conventional intellectual property security, but the big problem is that if everyone can get a natural phage, and they work just as well, probably, most of the time, and, you know, the kids can get that and grow them up in the high school lab, how do you secure that? And the answer appears to have come from areas like digital art. So if you want something that you know is the real thing, something that hasn't been passaged half a dozen times, I mean, how many times have people in this audience got a strain that they thought was the perfect type strain that it turns out to have been passaged half a dozen times and it's completely different to the other version of the strain that they already had in the lab which is supposed to be exactly the same thing. So you want the real deal, you want to know its provenance and digital provenance security is now a standard thing. You know, things like blockchain technology for those who have of you who are familiar with it and understand it, which doesn't include me, but people who deal with digital art, antiques, that sort of thing, they do this for a living and it's quite feasible and practical. And of course, we need to, as everyone around the world needs to do, all the clinicians, 
and the researchers around the world need to engage with the regulators. So we have been um, rather indulged by our own regulators. We as a group meet with our Therapeutic Goods Administration and the separate genetic regulator, because in this country genetic, reg genetic modification is regulated separately to therapeutic goods, but we meet with both of them in a working party every couple of months to try and develop this regulatory framework, because I think our government recognises that the existing regulatory frameworks of medicines and biologicals are just not fit for purpose. So if this falls to the public purse, where does it fit? If you ask the question in this country, and I think we're probably similar to most, if you look at the health interventions that were made in the last decade or so, and you look at the the uh, quality adjusted life year benefit for each of those interventions, and this is a health economist term, and for those who are not familiar with it, the idea is that clearly a year of life is not the same. A year of life in pain and suffering is not the same as a year of life of a healthy person completely free of disease, back at work, paying taxes, you know. These are different concepts and so the quality adjusted life year accommodates that and is a common way to measure bang for the buck when government is figuring out how to spend the health dollar. So if you look at the interventions in our country that were made, we can see that the sweet spot is around about $30,000 for quality adjusted life year and that a coronary artery bypass grant is a bit on the expensive side. But a kidney transplant is a good deal for the taxpayer. ICU services are a great deal for the taxpayer. And bone marrow transplantation, very expensive, but such a great outcome is a, also hugely, uh, hugely cost-effective for the taxpayer. And if you look at the available data of efficacy for phage therapy and the estimate that was done by the team who did this, which was an external... Um, health technology analysis firm suggest that they looked mostly at sepsis and in um, hip and knee replacements and they estimated from the published data something like 60% efficacy and remember you're talking about rescue therapy often not very well diagnostically guided and they looked at the costs that we got from quotes to outsource getting phages sent in and they estimated that it was about the same value for money as bone marrow transplantation and ICU, so about 5,000 bucks for a quality adjusted life year. So this is in the category of the must-haves in the health system in terms of value for money. If you look at the cost, and we also asked them to model what would have happened if all the infected hips and knees in Australia had received bacteriophage therapy given what we currently know from the published data, not our data and not a guesstimate, but the published data about efficacy, which was a little less than 60%, they estimated that we would have saved nearly 2,000 operations and more than 300 premature deaths and maybe 123 million Australian dollars just from a single year of making that available. So it's clearly creating value the other really important point here, and I think this relates to how you set this all up, is that because this is a, this is a system that's built around fermentation and growth strategies, then clearly you can, you can cook up litres and litres and piles and piles of bacteriophages, or you can cook up a tiny batch in an Eppendorf. So if you are treating a single patient and you're only going to use that batch once and you're going to chuck the rest out, because remember, I've just told you before that this is a highly specific, there's a, a phage for every bacteria and a bacteria for every phage, but they're very specific. You only use it once, it's gonna be very expensive, especially if you're using GMP, which is where we're going to have to go if we're going to make this available in the local pharmacy. So the trick is to make sure that you're using enough of your batch. If you have a batch life of about a year or so, and you can, look at the relative usage of that batch being about six to eight courses for that year, and you look at the average batch size generating 100 to 1,000 courses, which is the kind of sizes we would use in, you know, in, in litre size fermentation, then you get a cost per dose around about the cost of linezolid, something like that. If you can increase your 
um, usage beyond that 10% inflection point, you can get your cost quite low and you can see about $5,000 a batch, a, a course, I should say. So $5,000 for a course of, anti for, of, of an antibacterial is actually in the realm of the antibiotic antibiotic costs, so this is acquisition costs we're talking about here. So in other words, it can actually be cost effective if you make sure you use a bit of the stuff that you make. So I mentioned before that we have to deal with our regulators. Um, our genetic regulator is separate. They look at the genetically modified phages that we use and they license each individual use. So we've got, um, uh, a young girl we're treating, or we've just finished treating recently with um, Mycobacterium cessus on the background of cystic fibrosis, and she was treated with some of Graham Hatful's um, genetically modified phages, and we had to get a license just for that therapy. So this is clearly not practical if you have to get a license from the regulator for every single course. So they are now talking about how they might manage this as a class. The therapeutic regulator, which is the normal therapeutic goods, so this would be the EMA, the FDA and other jurisdictions, um, they talk about the idea of um, proving safety and efficacy to get approval. Clearly they will require good manufacturing practice to move into the standardised pharmacopoeia and this is going to need some clinical trials. Now the trouble with this is of course this is a therapy that's been around for a long time and everyone's a bit confused about whether we should be doing original you know phase one safety data put a bit on your skin and make sure your skin doesn't sort of all peel off where well, we've actually been using it intravenously for decades um, but at the moment here we use it as like an experimental IND or a compassionate use. We call it our special access scheme. And essentially most of the applications here will be in the life and limb category. So we're saying, look, um, this person is going to lose their life or, or, or is at greatly increased risk of or lose their limb, like the little girl I mentioned before. And that's the typical justification that we use here. And then the other question, of course, is prescriber training. One of the things that everyone has been saying, we all say to ourselves is, we don't know how to use this stuff. We're not familiar with it. It's a completely new therapy. It's prescribed differently to an antimicrobial. Many of us are not very familiar with the biology of these things during infection. And so one of the things that we have, think we have benefited from is by gathering together our big cohort of infectious diseases specialists and phage biologists from around the country, from all the academic institutions around the country. It gives us a little group of people to share experience and, and bounce ideas off. And once they get to the point where the international literature and our own experience is starting to refine what a best case practice or best practice looks like, we'll be ensuring that our internal network will be on top of that. It's likely that our regulator will deem authority. You can have deemed competence, in other words, an individual special licence, you know, um, you, uh, Dr. X, can use experimental therapy Y because we, the government, think you're safe to do it, but no one else can do it. Or you can say, you group of specialists, you group of hematologists can treat lymphoma with these dreadful chemotherapy agents, but no one else can do that because we don't trust them to do it. And it may well be that our government will say, look, Infectious diseases and specialties like that are a logical place to start in the same way that antibiotics, uh, many antibiotics are restricted to infectious diseases specialists. So to bring it into the pharmacopoeia, we still need a mechanism for these one-off therapies. We still need a way to provide for the individuals who have some dreadful bacteria that is not common. Maybe you don't see it very often in your hospital. Maybe it's just been imported, but you still need to be able to treat it. This is basically what we're doing at the moment. And we manage this with essentially endpoint quality control and the issue relates to sourcing. But clearly as we move on to a more professional approach, we need to look for these economy of scales. And that means we need to pick the winners. So I said to you before that we needed to get that sweet spot, which is probably around about 10% ideally 20% usage of a batch. And a batch, it varied, the yield obviously varies from bacteria to bacteria and from phage to phage. So one phage will produce 
more or less in a different bacteria and, and so it's all a bit specific. But if you assume that most litre, multi-litre batches will generate tens to hundreds of courses and each course is about, let's say, 30 doses, which is twice a day for two weeks and a couple that you, you know, drop on the floor, then you need to be able to, to pick those that are likely to be requested. So when we go to someone like Steve Tong, who spoke a minute ago, and say, what are the staph aureus that are most likely to cause a bacteremia, to cause an infection in Australian hospitals, you can get an answer that says, well, look, we've done a survey. Jeff Coombs here in WA supervises the national surveillance program for staph aureus and can tell you which are the types of staph aureus that are specifically infecting Australians at the moment and which were the ones that infected them two years ago. And that means that if you're designing a phage therapy system, you can say, okay, well, let's get all those phages and let's develop uh, all those bacteria, and let's develop phages against them. And we know, for example, that for Staph aureus, because its diversity in terms of um, uh, phage susceptibility is less than others, that you can cover about 90% plus with about four different phages. So it's not difficult to get a phage therapy solution for Staph aureus that will be used for more than 10% of a batch. So Staph aureus is the low-hanging fruit, and it's no, no uh, surprise that the international uh, community, the international industry uh, leaders are going after Staph aureus at the moment. But you can do this for anything, of course. You can do this for E. coli, for Pseudomonas, for Citrobacter, for whatever you want, and it's all going to be about a law of diminishing returns, isn't it? If you only see something rarely, then it's not going to be very cost-effective, produce a bunch of phages against it that are just waiting and, you know, dying on the shelf while you wait for them to be used. So we must retain the capacity to do individual use cases, and this is what we're trying to argue to our regulator at the moment. So we're at the endpoint QC stage. As I said at the moment, but clearly you can identify through epidemiology a subset of phages that you are really much more likely to use. And this gives you the capacity to develop a working cell bank, as you would, this sort of terminology that would use in, you know, GMP production of this type, a subset of, of production that is going through the stream in standardised processes. And if we can work with the regulators here to define that, we should be able to build a reasonable amount of diversity into a properly regulated GMP, pro GMP process. At the moment, the challenge is to get the phages, of course. You know, they're tremendously diverse. Everybody's got a collection. Every researcher in phage biology around the world has got their favourite bug that they go after, and they've got buckets of phages, sometimes thousands and thousands of bacteriophages of various degrees of uh, um, characterisation. And one of the easiest ways to connect this all up, of course, is just virtually. So we have established a database through which we can identify the phages we need by simply contacting someone. I mean, if I want an entrobacterophage, I know I can go to Jeremy's lab and say, Jeremy, can you help us out? If I want an anti-pseudomonal phage and I don't happen to have one that works, and I reached out to Ran and Ronan, the Hebrew University of Israel, of Jerusalem, uh, not long ago, then you can see how this can work with, with virtual linking. Eventually, the phages that are requested more often will be more and more distributed, and if you've got a nice digital signature, you can capture that provenance. And there is a way, I think, to secure the distribution of properly provenanced phages inside a network. And this is what we're trying to do right now. That's actually quite a challenge, of course. And you have to have a standardised way to characterise it, which is something else we're all doing in the network. So in the European system, the, the Belgians talk about a passport. So at Science Sino Institute, um, the uh, public health institute that certifies the phages that are coming out of Queen Astrid Military Hospital, they issue a passport, which is basically a genomic safety and a batch safety report. So we need to do the same kind of thing here, obviously. We need to characterise the phages so that we understand their host range, and that characterisation needs to be standardised. 
It's no good if everybody tests the host range in diverse labs against a different set of isolates. So the challenge inside our network is therefore to define that set of isolates, which are the key isolates, to define the host range. So you can see that you need not only the phage banking, but you need the bacterial banking and the high quality surveillance systems, just like if you were running a flu vaccine program, to pull it all together, to get a standardised description that means the same thing to everyone. And then when you're prescribing, of course, you need some sort of a diagnostic. We've talked about that before. There are some biological and technical issues with it, but essentially it looks like what we do for antibiotics. So it should not be too challenging to bring into the routine laboratory. And we have uh, simply a prescription, as you would expect, um, just like any prescription. And then the pharmacy needs to know basic details about the safety of the phage. And that's mostly talking about the genomic potential. Um, and safety of the bacterial strain that you cook it up in. Obviously, if you want to treat uh, some nasty uh, bacteria, then the phage that's good at treating it is likely to want to grow in that nasty bacteria. So you could be theoretically co-purifying bacterial toxins. So you need to be able to manage all this sort of stuff in your production system. And then, of course, there's traditional uh, production safety. So that's just things like defining the endotoxin amount, the bacterial debris that might cause an inflammatory response in your product. In the same way that if you used E. coli to make insulin, you'd have to do. So it's not something that's foreign to us at all. And of course, this is not unique to human health. So everywhere bacteria cause a problem, we could argue that phages provide a solution. People talk about using them as a bioremediation tool. There are lots of uses for bacteriophages that are beyond human health. And some people argue that, look, human health's really hard to get this started. Maybe you should be working outside of it first. But in any case, that's where we are at the moment. And for those who are based here in our host city, you don't have to go far to find phage expertise and interest here. Um, but I think we can summarise now, because we're just about out of time, by saying that, look, I think this is clearly safe therapy when it's properly prepared. Bioavailability is an issue, but you can basically use it like an antibiotic, either with antibiotics or even as a replacement to it. We've talked about IP, and we've talked about susceptibility testing. Uh, we think it's really important to learn as we go from compassionate use cases, and we need to understand how and why some phages are better than others. Finally, Rob and I have a plug. We are now at the start, we've been running really as a scientifically oriented community, but we're now thinking that we need, at least the international community generally is are thinking that we need to start to put our cases before skeptical physicians. So, uh, you know, the physicians in the audience will be well uh, versed in and familiar with the grand round concept, but for those who are not, the idea is that someone like me will get up and say, I treated this person the other day and look at all these dumb things I did and how can we learn from this and isn't this really interesting and instructive? So the issue is, can we as an international community get together and start to present cases of phage therapy that we can learn from and put it before sceptical clinical colleagues who are going to pin us to the wall like a butterfly with a needle. So that's Greg German in the top left from um, um, University of Toronto. There's Gina Saar from Mayo Clinic. That's uh, Ran Nir Paz from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And that's Samane Katami from uh, University of Sydney. And that's, that's really the starting cohort. But what we want to do is test drive this amongst ourselves because between us we've got enough cases to present. And then gradually this community will grow into a normal grand rounds, I think. So, look, I'm going to wind this all up by thanking all the people that I work with and remind you that in our host city we have lots of expertise and interest in phage therapy. And thank all my colleagues... Um, who've contributed to all the brainstorming we've had to do to develop this Phage Australia concept, and of course the funders who helped us out. And I'm gonna stop there, Gina.